What is up, guys? And welcome to a very special Halloween edition of Somewhere in the Livestream, where we are going to break down the movie No One Will Save You Tonight. Um, tonight, I say, here in the UK, it's 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard for my guests today. So how they are reviewing a horror movie at 1.30 in the afternoon is beyond me. But I thank them immensely for doing that. I thank all of you for being here. Whether you're on the West Coast, East Coast, UK, wherever you are, Australia, welcome. Welcome. We're going to be taking your comments tonight, guys, getting your thoughts and opinions on No One Will Save You, this kind of sleeper movie that came kind of came out of nowhere and has become kind of a cult classic for us here in the UFO field very quickly. Um, but before we even get to the movie, I'm going to bring in our guests for today. You know them well. They do our movie reviews here every year here at Somewhere in the Skies and Somewhere in the Livestream. And that are my, that are, that is my actor and filmmaker friends, Nick Westermeyer and Andrew Sanford. So let's bring them in. Gentlemen, what is going on? Well, you only see my hat? That's yes, I can. All right. And the fighting nun behind me. She'll make I it. love it. I love yeah, it. Yeah. Man. This I is love from my, my sister-in-law. She gets me. <laughs> oh my gosh that thing is a little scary i'm not gonna lie it the is it's pretty looks, terrifying the face looks extremely hyper real yeah 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 oh she's ready. bringing back really bad flashbacks of all my education <laughs> uh, yeah dude i don't know about you guys but our our nuns at my catholic school they were a little uh a little punitive when it came Don't to uh, wearing hats you. in school. Yeah, I know. I know. I'll find you, Ryan. <laughs> we, I, I didn't go. I went to a public school, but I did attend CCD on Sundays until I got my confirmation. And I primarily remember um, having a teacher that got really mad when somebody questioned George W. Bush. I don't even know how he got brought up. Um, but yeah, so that's awesome. that's what I learned about the Bible. <laughs> wow. Love it. Love it. The name I didn't think would come up in this conversation, but it did. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. I'm only going to talk about Bush for the rest of the podcast. Um, oh, fair enough. <laughs> that's that's fair the enough. Yeah. <laughs> there are some, let's, let's be fair, there are some religious undertones in this movie, which I think we can maybe touch sure. on. A yeah, little yeah, yeah. bit of allegory, maybe, um, but we'll uh -huh. get there. We'll get there. Um, before we get to the movie, um, did you guys know about this? Like, had you heard anything about this movie coming out prior to me being like, hey, there's a new alien abduction movie out. I would love to know what you two think as filmmakers, as actors, as writers. And uh, before I threw this, this pretty impromptu review session together, did, did you know anything about No One Will Save You? No. You go um, ahead, I, Nick, because now I have I to knew, check it. I knew it was out only because I have another filmmaker friend of mine who's doing kind of like, like we used to do like a Shocktober thing, but he just watches a bunch of horror movies and then posts just his review on them. And so this is one of the first ones he did. Um, oh, where he okay. was like, oh, I really liked it. So that's the only reason why I had known about it. Um, and then you started <coughs> watching it probably like two or three days after that. So it had been on my radar because of that. But otherwise, no. Um, I'm, also, I'm also admittedly a little behind in my scary movie watching. Yes, <laughs> that's fair. That's yeah, fair. How dare you? Yeah, I, uh, I'm not uh, fueling, fueling me anymore. <laughs> I um, I work for a pop culture slash uh, politics slash a little bit of everything website called Pajiba.com. P A J I B A. Um, and so I had I had seen the trailer for this ahead of time, um, and was really new. It was one of those things where. Actually, I think I didn't see the trailer. What I think happened is I saw people start to talk about this about a month ago when the trailer came out. And I was like, ooh, interesting. And then I remember seeing that there was kind of an overwhelmingly positive response for it. Mm -hmm. And if something like that happens, I will stop watching trailers or looking up things or anything like that and kind of just take the movie as is sometimes that'll happen too if there's an overwhelmingly negative response to something but i yeah. um when there's kind of no like middle of the road and let me, like i'm not interested i try to like cut myself off so this one i did that for um and uh and then i think i it's funny i think i might have watched it the day you texted us about this lesson so oh, it's, nice. um yeah 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 so i was uh 
um, sure. I was ready to go. Well, and I mean, let's let's just say it up front here. We're looking at like an 82% certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes right now. It's pretty sure. damn for a movie like yeah. this that had no fanfare, really, no real no. true marketing, came out on a streaming platform, which is something I want to talk to you guys about. Um, and yeah, just kind of really came out of nowhere. And again, whenever these alien abduction movies come out, um, and I know we covered, I think maybe two years ago, the found footage film, alien abduction found footage films that we watched. Very mm -hmm. scary, very, um, some of them brutal, um, which is this film as well. Um, but whenever they come out, I think us in the UFO field are like, oh no, it's just going to be another big Hollywood horror movie where the aliens are hunting people down and it's going to be torture and and when in reality, a lot of the abduction cases that have been on record as, you know, quote unquote, credible and whatnot, um, aren't like this. They're not sure. terrifying. They're not like fire in the sky. <clears throat> stuff like that. Um, or like this movie. So when this came out, I think all of us were immediately a little on the defensive. And then I watched sure. it. And mm -hmm. oh my God, like. This, I, 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 again, I know I'm kind of putting the cart before the horse, but I was thoroughly impressed by this. Not from a, not from a UFO researcher standpoint, um, but as a film enthusiast, as someone who hopes to and inspires to create films like this someday. Um, yeah, really blew me away. So that's kind of my, uh, my cart before the horse, but let's not do that. Let's, let's start from the beginning, right? Let's, um, Let's get the old stream, or excuse me, the old uh, poster. What do Great they call poster. that? Slideshow. Yeah, right. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Very good um, initial marketing, I think. Um, but like I said, this came out on Hulu, and not everyone has Hulu. And no. this film, in my personal opinion, I think needed to be seen on a big screen. See, um, oh, see, I disagree. I think Hulu is the right place for it. As you were saying all that, I think that like. It's well, anyway, I think that a streaming platform for a movie like this was the right venue for it. Oh, uh, okay. Which I can talk about as we get into the movie why I feel that way. Okay. Um, from like a movie going perspective. Cool, cool. Yes. Yeah, I, I, think I, I, I kind of fall somewhere in between on that as well because it's, I also would have loved to see it on a big screen. Um, similar to Prey, which was also put on Hulu Ooh, last year yeah. that also right, has really, a really. thing singular female lead fighting against monsters from space. So Hulu has clearly found their niche. Um, but <laughs> Good point. I do think that there is a chance that it wouldn't have reached as many people if it wasn't on a streaming service initially. I, I don't know how this would have done in theaters. I think like to dovetail off that, like what Andrew said, especially with Prey, like I would agree with Prey. Like Prey, I would have loved to have gone and seen in the theaters, but Prey still felt... Maybe because it's Predator, maybe because it's this very like marketable known franchise, like that. Mm. Uh, it feels more big budget to me in that way. It feels more like I'm watching uh, a commercial, a Hollywood commercial movie. I know they did a ton of risks and different stuff, but like because it's the Predator, this movie had yeah. this movie to me takes takes a lot of like indie risks, does a lot of risky underlying risky filmmaking things that yeah. I think. Being not on a big screen, being on a streaming service uh, allows it that opportunity because you're not, you don't have to cater to like bring in as much money, right? It's not, it's not looking for revenue in the same way. And so they can do a lot of stuff, which I'll talk about with that actress. I think for her, especially, who I think is great. Um, mm -hmm. That it being a streaming service movie allows it to take these, these chances a little bit more, um, which is what I, I that like. That makes sense. Yeah. I, I that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it does make think... sense in a very, in a very depressingly accurate way. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, no, no, I, no, totally. Because this is, it, there used to be a point where they studios would take risks on stuff like this yeah. in theaters, and it could probably surprise them. But I, I thank you, Nick, for being our studio representative and accurately <laughs> saying um, that this wouldn't have made enough money. So it's true. <laughs> well, I think it's about true. like like Insidious, right? Which made like was made on like a really small budget but made like tons of money. And at the time I think it was a pretty risky studio movie. Right. But you still had like Patrick Wilson, you still had like some name names and I'm forgetting her name at the moment. And like, I know her from um, 
Both Rose Byrne. Them. I would I would argue neither of them were very big names with that movie. What? Patrick Wilson at like, the time? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Patrick, Patrick Wilson, Matthew, what had he done? He had done The Conjuring. Like, watch, we, no, Conjuring no, was, was, was an album before Insidious. Insidious. Insidious was before that. Insidious and was before he, The Conjuring? Yeah, I, I think, think as, far, as far as like bigger things are concerned, Patrick Wilson had done like Watchmen. Yeah. Had he done, I mean, I guess, which the real question is, had he done Phantom of the Opera yet? Yes. Yes. Yes, he had. Okay. So, okay. So, he, he had, he had. And he had done Angels of America. And then <laughs> but I remember specifically for Watchmen, Zack Snyder went about casting that movie with actors that were like actors, actors, like not like no, like not really yeah. named people for the most part. Um, like you had Jackie Earl Haley in there, but even he was still kind of like a long time character actor. But it, um, it would, I would, I, it also, Insidious, produced by James Wan, written by Lee mm-hmm. Wannell. I just don't think that one in particular was as much of a risk, if that makes okay, sense. That's so, that's yeah. So, yeah, I get totally. Um, yeah. It didn't do as I many think, risky things as this did as a film. Yeah, but. sure. I, I think what we're all trying to get at is that, like, there were no big names in this. Just um, right. Writing oh, wise, great. director wise, acting wise. Um, but uh, Caitlin Deaver, who we'll get to, our main protagonist, had a very very challenging uh, mission in this movie, mm-hmm. which we will get to. Um, it's pretty much the one thing everyone's really talking about with this movie. Um, but let's let's give a little, I'm going to give a little plot synopsis before we start really digging in. Um, no One Will Save You. This came out, gosh, just about a month ago at this point it's on classic. Hulu. Yeah. Um, this introduces Bryn Adams, a creative and talented young woman who's been alienated from her community. Lonely but ever hopeful, Bryn finds solace within the walls of the home where she grew up until she's awakened one night by strange noises from decidedly unearthly intruders. What follows is an action-packed face-off between Bryn and a host of extraterrestrial beings who threaten her future while forcing her to deal with her past. I love that. That's a very concise thing. Um, This is written and directed by Brian Duffield, um, who is known for... Love and Monsters, Underwater, which is the only one of his I've seen, and The Babysitter. Um, were you um, guys familiar with this guy's I, movies? At I all? know The Babysitter. That's the only one that I've seen, but that movie is phenomenal. Okay. I yeah, I um I have seen Babysitter and Underwater and did not particularly care for either film. Oh. Um but I do think that Underwater was less him. I remember the big the, the spoilers for under like I won't get into spoilers for underwater, but I remember very specifically that movie felt like something that it was changed in post. That wasn't what it was originally. All of a sudden, there is this like Lovecraft angle that, yeah, almost by the director's own admission, is kind of like forced in after they filmed the movie. Um, yes. And yeah. and this is I will only say this because I'm about to say that I absolutely love No One Will Save You. Um, and I'm a big horror comedy fan. There were some elements of the babysitter that I found to be very racist. So okay, that was a that's little fair. bit harder. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. And it's it's kind of one of those tough things that just happens when you do in comedy. Is <laughs> but at, at the end, Ed, he didn't direct that either. You know what I mean? I think what we're seeing now. I heard Love and Monsters is pretty fantastic. And sometimes when you write a script, especially for Netflix, which um, babysitter was written for it's handed off to somebody else and you're probably not involved in the slightest right yeah. so uh with no one will save you and i've also heard love and monsters is very good it was kind of like a surprise hit um i think it's nice to see this guy just really fully control of what he is doing i like this i this movie has a kind of confidence that i think personally those other two movies do not have um, mm-hmm. And he's done a lot of work too. He's a really smart guy. He's really funny. Um, and I, um, yeah, I, I don't, I, I, I don't think the other stuff was his fault. So yeah, I was very excited to watch this movie and just kind of enjoy it. From it it's to so that. hard when you see written and directed by, cause you're immediately like, okay, well, what could this have been? How, how could this movie have done if it was seen through the vision of someone other than the writer? You know, mm-hmm. so I always think it's very risky when someone writes and directs their own film. Um, mm-hmm. But I think you're right, Andrew. I think with this one, this was him in complete control of the story he set out to tell with not a ton of studio backing. You had 20th Century Fox, obviously. Um, but we're not talking, you know, 
this control like Netflix has over sorts sure. of things like that or huge, huge Hollywood studios. Oh. Um, they kind of just let him make his movie, which 20th, 20th Century Fox is pretty well known for doing. It's kind of letting letting their creatives go off and, and do what they want to do, at least in the history of the stuff I've seen from them. Well, and that's the whole point we had come back earlier about like where the the medium, where we get to watch it, right? And I think that that's where like streaming is lucky because again, you can you can be like, all right, fine, go make this. And listen, if, they, if he makes this movie and it, and it doesn't do well and you're like, it kind of sucked, then it, it lives forever floating on Hulu with a small audience that maybe really likes it. Like they're, they're I mean, I know there's always, but they're risk reward maybe, ratio. Maybe it lives forever. <laughs> maybe, 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 maybe. But, but like the risk reward is so Go much watch Will, Willow the TV show. Oh God, don't hurt me that way. <laughs> which, is also, me that way? which is also Disney, by the way. Oh, you know, don't. Which is also what 20th Century Studios is. I'm and just saying. You I'm just to bring you, everybody you down. Her, and you know why? Because I'm going to have to finish it. I was like... <laughs> Three episodes away from finishing it and didn't get it done. Anyway, well, welcome, welcome to Willow, um, Willow, Willow Tower. Tower. Yeah, yeah, Willow <laughs> Memorial here. Uh, uh, so one um, thing, I, can I? I yeah, yeah, go ahead. Nick. This doesn't matter about the storytelling. Um, I loved. I, I again, I loved the costumes in this. Her, the, oh, her yeah. costuming in this film, I just loved. Like she came out and I was like, "That's cute. She looks cute." Like they just whoever the costume designer is did a really great job with her because one of the things about this actress that I that I like is she's one of the actresses who's going to look way younger than roles she plays for a very long time. Um, yeah, because she still looks like a teenager, and I know she's in her twenties in this because yeah. of uh, something I'll bring up later, which made me feel old. Um, but I thought the costumer did such a great job at like tying her aesthetic into the house that she lives in, like making the way that she dresses and the house were all to me characters in this film. And I thought that was fantastic. And that's like a huge kudos to that design team. Um, and I, I just, I really, maybe it's cause I'm teaching design right now in my class, but I just noticed that I'm like, she, she looks great. It aesthetically looks really good. It sets a clear vibe for who like she is or who she wants to be. Um, and her, the, the costumes just pop, especially at the beginning and at the end, which we'll, I'm sure we'll talk yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel I like the aesthetic really popped, like bookended in terms yeah. of like how the movie starts, how the movie ends. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, col it was so colorful. It was so rustic. It was so, um, it really served, I think, the beginning of the story, which is we don't really know who this, um, right. this girl is. We just know that she lives in this, big sort of farm almost farmhouse uh and she's very kind of um what's the word i'm looking for um isolated isolated uh eccentric you know she's got a dollhouse so immediately yeah. you're kind of like hmm this is interesting uh what's, I, what I, where is this story going especially when you know inevitably what is going to happen right well and i think too uh Nick, I actually think it does do some stuff to storytelling wise because they have to um, endear you to a character that we get details about very slowly throughout the film. Like they mm -hmm. have to give you on somebody's side while also hiding why no one is on her side. Uh, because I think if they revealed like kind of the twist earlier on, um, which they I think they easily could have and maybe a less confident uh, filmmaker might have. Um, it would have been hard to be on her side while she's getting chased. I think, um, I think it's not it's yeah. the only reason you can. And I, look, there's also the, like there's stuff that happened, like the thing, the big incident that necessitates her loneliness happens when she's like 12. And I think anybody would be like, well, clearly that was a mistake. Um, but we're standing, you know, we're removed from the situation. Yeah. Um, but it right. was a nice, you know, they spent the her like she's dancing by herself. Oh, that she, and making the food. Like I love the, that. Yeah, moment. it was it yeah. was all stuff that was very. Um, you just kind of get on her side pretty quick, or at least I did. You just kind of it makes you go like, oh, here's a fun quirky person that's doing things alone, and you know, just a year and a half, two years ago, we were all doing a lot of similar things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 that's you such know, so. a good point, man. And um, very cute yard. Her yard decoration, 
on, <laughs> on point. So I know, old now, guys. This is, this well, is I'm at. I, I think you guys bring up so many good points. Um, you know, we're, we're thrust into the life of this young, lonely girl who's, you know, writing letters that we're not really sure why or to whom. Um, she has, as someone pointed out in the chat, a diorama of the town. It wasn't a dollhouse, excuse me. Um, it right. was sort of this really cool diorama that she made. So clearly she's very creative. Um, she's a seamstress as well. She makes a lot of her own clothes. Um, these are clearly things that she does to fill her time and, and essentially fill these voids in her life of loneliness, as we will slowly find out why. Right. But let, let's kind of go there. Before we really even get to, um, you know, the crux of the film, um, we see that she's having a lot of trouble stepping outside of this bubble, of this home, of this yard. And when she does, um, we get kind of our first glimpses of something's off. Like, mm -hmm. I think she first sees it's the postman, maybe, or somebody. Think, yeah, kind of, well, she sees um, the postman, and then she sees a neighbor that just kind of, like, stares at her. Yeah. Really, yeah, yeah, yeah. To mail the dress. Yeah. Right. And you're immediately like, why are these people, like, so standoffish to her? What, what's, what's going on here? Um, and that was the first moment where I'm like, okay, something's up. I'm sure we will slowly learn why. Um and, and I'm trying not to, only, before, sorry, yeah, yeah. not to interrupt, but before she goes outside, it's been, I think, a little, about a week or more since I watched this, is that, because we do see the letters, but then she, she says something about, like, or she writes something about, like, I thought it was my fault, or, like, I still feel like it was my fault. Um, yes, so I had kind true. of started, I assumed it had something to do with that, but it was still, you know, again. So just because I watched it last night, um, so you have that. And then also, I think in that beginning, if I remember, you see some of the pictures of her and her friends. So you are, right. you get this illusion. And then she does the thing, which again, the acting work that she does in this, um, when, you know, she's doing all the stuff around her house and um, she like practices smiling, like to be able to like get right. Like, oh, you see her God, prepping yeah. to go into the town and it's just like, right. you, can, <sighs> you mean it, those little things like you're saying, Andrew, are such a nice setup for what's coming later on. Um, yeah. I liked her so much, like, as we've gone, even before, like, the aliens, like, I, I felt for this character so much. I got to the point in this movie where, like, I didn't care what happened. Like, I got to that point, too. Where I was like, something bad happened. And if I don't find out, then I don't find out. Yeah, right. Was because, I mean, really well at the, yeah, at, at the front of this, this is a, quote, unquote, like, alien invasion movie and i think that's kind of what even i went in wanting like i was and they waste no time no like time. i they know really we've don't. Spent, yeah we've spent some good time setting up this character but we spent more time than the movie did i mean these were yeah. very concise snippets of this girl's life before she is thrust into something um literally unbelievable um, great, right. great storytelling because if you can do all oh. that, I mean, it's really, especially with film, I think Andrew, you can attest to this, like to do all that, like that's one of the hallmarks of film, right? You can do all this storytelling really fast through pictures and moments and to get an audience to um, connect to her and to relate to her and to root for her um, mm. with spending very, like very little fat on the bone, like really, you know, did not waste a beat to get you to like the action that's happening because yeah. it's really just her in this movie. For the most part, um, right. um, I think that that the, the, the director did a just great job at that. It's executed yeah. really, really well. Let's let's get to it. So we we you know we see that she has a pretty routine life of kind of whatever selling these dresses or whatnot on like Etsy or whatever. This is how she kind of makes her living. Um, and then you know she goes to bed one night and. Um, this is where it all starts to happen. Um, you get this kind of prototypical beginning of a alien abduction scenario. Uh, something, a craft of some sort appears over someone's home or their, a light shows up in their yard. And then, boom, uh, we start to see shadow figures going past windows and and whatnot we start she starts hearing things in the home some sort of intruder uh and 
it was very, very well done. I mean, this is how a lot of these abduction scenarios basically begin. Um, but again, the film really wastes no time with ambiguity. They, we're not, we're not going to see that this is like someone robbing her house. We're not right. going to see that this is like an animal that snuck in. Um, almost immediately, we are shown that this is an alien. So, what did you guys think of the first, I guess, reveal? I, I was actually, and I, I was going to ask you about this as well, because I know you and I have talked about the image of Greys specifically on here before, mm -hmm. me being uh, a little bit more of a layman when it comes to some of that stuff. Um, and I thought it was a smart choice to not, to go with something that is pretty universally recognizable as a design and then kind of doing variations on that design. Because yes. again, we don't have the time to be like, these are the Clarks from Revlon 7. Like, we don't have the time to get into their mission or any of that stuff. They need to be like, these are aliens and they are invading. So you go with the easiest kind of, you know, easy being a relative term. Um, yeah. The most recognizable design options and then kind of play with that as the film goes on, which is very smart, I thought. And it, it does kind of... Not that I think they weren't focused on that stuff, but they were like the important part of this movie. Um, and I think uh, the better genre movies are this way is the story that it's telling about a woman dealing with a tragic accident in her past and dealing with kind of just being stuck that way. The alien, the alien stuff is secondary to a certain right. extent, at, at least as far as like what their main focus is. So because of that, I thought they just, that was a very smart reveal. I thought it was still very scary because I thought they look very, um, um, cause I thought they looked scary and I just thought it's really, um, it just kind of smacks you. Like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like we're again, we're it, it, like you said, it happens so quickly and then you're just kind of off to the races. And then, I mean, as soon as we see one of these things for the first time, she kills one. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> yep. there like we go. Within minutes. That, which is like, I expected this to be one of those movies where they're hunting her throughout the entire film. Mm -hmm. And then finally she gets the comeuppance and escapes, but no, like almost immediately we see almost the um, I guess you could call it like the the fallibility of this supposedly advanced race of aliens coming to abduct her or whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, you you she immediately takes a piece, like you said, Andrew, from like the diorama and stabs this thing straight up in the side of the head and yeah, uh, essentially Mert uh, kills it. Does it die? Yeah. I don't yeah. remember. Yeah, yes. I think it dies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. dead, yeah. dead. It real dead. Yeah. It, um, it dead. It dead. <laughs> it dead. Yeah, you know, it's something that with the alien design too that um, I'm sure we'll talk to as we get more towards the end, but I like that they took a very recognizable design concept and then even in this first one then did like little things with it to make it unique. Yes. Like I thought the the way it stood up on its appendages, like on its toes. Um, oh man, what a great, holy shit, oh, what a great shot. Right, because it's just oh. those, those little things that like uh, make it off or add, make it off to us, right? Like it also allows you, I think a little bit of leeway in the budget since you're doing a CGI alien. Like to, you make these little things that feel off so it can be a little less uh, realistic, but like that movement work. The other thing I love that I thought was such a good choice along those same lines was the movement of the aliens themselves. That was very mm -hmm. like uh, almost in a different would be a frame rate. Like they, they moved mm -hmm. like a clock almost ticking. I thought like that unnatural movement, um, like almost out of time with her movement or our movement oh, was such a great, great choice. Like it yes. just makes, thank you, thank you, thank it makes this humanoid thing, right? That we are used to seeing seem different and different in a way that like i don't know if it creeped me out but it just was like it was just off-putting you're like this is this they're not it isn't right like it's you it's know what radically would you maybe say that they're alien alien oh alien oh hey -o. <laughs> you know what that reminded like me of? i'm so happy i'm so happy you brought that up like it seemed like the the alien was almost as at a different pace it reminded mm -hmm. me so much of that um 
that, and I know he's controversial, but that Casey Affleck movie, uh, the ghost one, a ghost yeah, story, the, I believe ghost, it was called, ghost, ghost story, yeah. where they literally filmed Casey Affleck, who is the ghost. Um, they filmed him at a different frame rate from the rest of the movie and yeah. then digitally inserted him into the scenes because they wanted to show that, you know, a non entity, a non human entity, even a ghost could be considered that, um, would not be moving in the same sort of space and time as we are, as we know right. it. And this reminded me so much of that when you saw the aliens moving, of yeah, like they traveled vast distances. They probably are able to sort of bend space and time to get here. So it is going to be a little different the way um, they move or, or interact with our environment. And, and too, that like, really stuck gonna, out to me. Like they're not anatomy. Like they're not, they're not flesh and bone in the same way. So like their bodies aren't going to work and mechanically work the way that like things on this earth do, which I thought was interesting right. as well. Like you don't know, what, are they bone? Are they muscle? Are they, because there's a lot of like turns the way it, turns itself is not anatomically how like we can turn and i thought yeah. that just those little those little like details in the creature design or alien design were just real nice yeah. mm -hmm. really let's good. let's touch on um the sound for a minute not mm -hmm. the dialogue but the sound um mm -hmm. I watched this with like my my stereo headphones, and that is really nice. the only reason I thought this needed to be seen in a theater. I would have loved mm. to have seen this with like real big Dolby surround sound sort of feel. But um, yeah, I it was the the sound design. Um, and I think I have the guy's name here. Sound designed by Smoky Cloud. That's yeah. the sound designer's name, Smoky Cloud. At least he was the oh, head yeah. of sound. Um. Oh my God. I loved it. Everything from the score to, um, uh, to just the house, the way she interacted with the house. Um, and then like the sounds of the alien when it first shows up and the creaking and the, the kind of grovelly, I wouldn't even know what to call it. Like almost breathing that the alien did when it first arrived. And then when eventually she kills this first one, I mean, you feel that diorama piece going into mm -hmm. its head and you hear every mm -hmm. single moment of that like penetration into its head and it's dying last dying breaths it was just so visceral Ugh. yeah you know Crazy. with that i think one reason that makes that so important and we haven't talked about this but might as well like there's also almost no dialogue in this movie does, does yeah. she speak i mean does she have uh, there I don't is think so. I think they right. said there's collective like three, three lines of dialogue. I have one of the lines here, which I think is the most important, but we'll get to that when yeah. we get to it. But so, um, when, when but yeah, doing... yeah, let's let's go there. Right, when that's right. No, that... she talks. Go ahead, Andrew. I was going to say she talks. Yeah, she talks at a point when it's in her mind, essentially. Yeah. Yes. But like, there's no. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think that that, yeah. that like, it, it reminded me a lot of what's the um oh god I'm forgetting his name. He's like the Netflix horror guy now. Um, and he made the whole movie with the deaf person um, who's being Mike Flanagan. Uh, Flanagan. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Think, think of that movie too. So anytime you're doing something, I think when you have an actor who doesn't speak or you're doing something that well, you lose dialogue in a film, the sound, right, becomes another, just like the setting becomes a character in and of itself. So oh, I think yeah. that like stuff like that, you know, what sounds the aliens make, what sounds the house makes, what sounds she does make, like, all, all that stuff becomes really important. So your sound designer, to me, the sound designer and your cameras are taking are taking place of all that dialogue. Um, right. And because of that, I think it's got to be just perfect. Again, we talk about the aliens, like even when they move, the sound of their movements, right? That like creaky, like, I don't know, unearthly alien sound, as Andrew would say. <laughs> um, all that stuff pops out at you because you're not listening, like there's, because you're not listening for anything said. Um, yep. And this designer did a great job at that. I mean, just there's so many good ambient sounds throughout the film. Um, yeah. And then she, you know, as the actress, like when she does create a dialogue, but sound like just yeah. like her, her emoting through non dialogue, um, her panting, um, her kind of small, yeah, like all, all that sort all that of stuff. breath intakes, everything was just so spot on. I can't imagine the work 
like the the physical work that the director had to do with her um and just what she naturally brought to that role when you show mm -hmm. up for a movie and you see that you have no dialogue i can't even imagine what she must have been thinking i mean either you're this not is really... terrifying or this is like the role of a lifetime yeah and more likely than not too she is spending 80 percent of the movie 70 percent of the movie reacting to a tennis ball on a stick or like yep. maybe maybe somebody in a green Good suit point. if she's lucky you know so it's a lot of um it's yeah enough can't be said about how how much heavy lifting she does as well just um, with her expressions but it and, is i think yeah. all that is right especially like it's there is so much needed to support um the dialogueness less nature of the uh, of the film that and i think every piece is is holding it together really nicely yeah and also just from like an audition standpoint like doing commercial auditions where a lot of times you have very little dialogue or you might have no dialogue and it's all like here's a camera like you're saying andrew like okay act, act. pretend like you're doing <laughs> like that work as, as an actor I, I don't think people realize how hard it is because we rely so much especially if you come from like a theater training you rely so much on that word right the ability to speak and use language and when you do when you lose that like on a film set um you know you're doing a close-up shot a reaction shot like you you know what one scene two scenes like it's you still have that language to fall back on so mm -hmm. um yeah andrew you're 100 right like acting without something there right a tennis ball and to do to, to be able to have to tell that whole story I mean, yeah, you have a good director and you have a good, you know, DP who's capturing these moments and they're going to edit that together. But like, that is, that is super challenging for an actor. You're like, great. You don't have to minimize yeah. lines, but like the, the, the weight you're going to pull on camera um, is monumental. I mean, it's, it's, it's a whole other type of masterclass. I'm, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to show a page of the screenplay. I don't know if you guys have seen this. It kind of went I'm viral. Familiar. I'm familiar. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, uh, we that. will show that in a little bit. Um, just to show how you write a screenplay like this. Because if anyone knows, I mean, most of a screenplay is dialogue. Um, right. You know, there's a and lot I will of say white this, on a page, but not with this one. <laughs> this page uh, in particular sparked a little bit of debate. And it was also... Um, I remember seeing a similar thing happening with Promising Young Woman. Um, in, in short, when you are taking screenwriting classes and you are looking at things and a lot of what you're taught at the beginning is the exact opposite of what this guy did for this script, which I think is pretty hilarious. Um, it, and it was the same for <laughs> Promising Young Woman. Um, there's the, and it's, and look, there are different, Duffield already uh, had a career going. The writer of Promising Young Woman, Nepo Baby. So like they have ways to get in um that are a little bit easier but um it is kind of one of those things where you just one of my favorite quotes about writing is, uh, is ever is from len ween who is a comic book writer who um uh was also editor on watchmen and uh did all kinds of incredible things over at dc comics he said he spent most of his early career learning what to take out of his work and the rest of his career learning what to leave in because there is this kind of it's one of these things yes you need to get the format down you need to have the basics your exterior exterior interior all that kind of stuff but you also still need people to read your script read and be entertained by the script so right. it's kind of this it's it's a constant fight <laughs> it, is. it is you know i i've been working with a couple screenwriters on one of my scripts right now um, because I, you know, I, I, I did go to school for playwriting, but, um, I took like one screenwriting course and essentially like, that's, that's what the world is now movies. And I wanted to adapt to that. And, um, I've worked very closely with a few of these screenwriters and them sort of showing me like, you're coming from a different world now, dude, like you're showing instead of telling where in plays are telling instead of showing. Um, so it is, it's such a fine line when you're writing a script as opposed to what you actually see on film. Um, let's show it. Let me just show yeah. the page. Why yeah. not? Um, so what I just kind of, oh my God. Uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. this looks nothing like a, what your typical screenplay will look like. Yeah. I know it's a little small. Let me see if I can actually, oh I'm going to 
bring it full screen. And, and I will say, I had seen this page before I saw the movie, and um, I it, the scene that is being described here um, is much this, later in the film, right? Yes, yes, it's much later. And since we'll probably have to jump ahead a little bit anyway, it gets to a point she's fighting all these greys, and then there she sees that there are these. It almost looks like a, a, a watery dragon fruit with with octopus <laughs> tentacles. Um, that, thing, yeah, there we go. There we go. I think I was pretty spot on. Um, yeah. and they, uh, <laughs> that are going into people and like possessing them, and it's very um, uh, Black Mercy plant for my DC fans out there. Um, we come mm. to learn, uh, but this script, the screen, the script page is describing one of these things going into her mouth, and there's really you could very easily say. It gets in her mouth. Um, but instead, if I may do a dramatic reading, uh, she came, she came, it's all got the grays. There's camo, slow move towards a camo, 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 rising up to camo, face to face, way to something's coming out of his fucking mouth. Out of his fucking mouth, out of his fucking mouth. Like it, that to me, if I had been reading a screenplay like this, got to that page, and I'm sure there are other examples in the screenplay of him doing stuff like this, maybe there's not, I would have been all in at this point. I oh, think God. He, he does such a great job setting us up to this point. And you're so entrenched in what's going on that this is such a great way to keep momentum going while also offering a little bit of a like, like this is as, as almost like visual writing in a certain way. Yeah. Like there is, this there is, is something. This shows what. Happens. Yes. Thanks, man. So I, well, you're like saving say the director um, a million steps. You're showing them the intensity of the scene, what's going through the character's head. Um, mm -hmm. When, you know, a lot of screen editors would say, no, no, you got to leave that up to the actor. Um, but when you have such a specific moment where, you know, these things are happening to her, um, I yeah, think this is th fantastic. This is up to the actor, though, because if I pick that screen up, like, you know, Andrew, if you're directing me, you're, you're like, here's your script. And I'm like, all right, dude. Mm -hmm. And you and I get to this scene, like, that's all up to me. There is nothing besides that. I cannot move. Like there is nothing there that's telling me like what that camera is going to do. What you know, like, you know, you pick up some scripts and like, I can see like, ideally I think about like, I was reading about James Gunn and his writing process. Like James Gunn will have like his script and pictures, right? Cause he's going to direct the thing probably. Mm -hmm. so he's drawing his storyboards in his script. So if you're an actor and you get that, you're like, Oh, well, okay. I know roughly what this shot is going to look like and what they're going to try to do. And like, I, for better or worse, like I pick that up and you're just like, Oh, cool. Okay, cool, 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 cool. So it's, you're just, you're capturing this moment, but it's completely open at that point between me and my director and, and my DP, uh, like how this moment is going to play out or what you need to see from it. I think that's really, really crazy, but also kind of brilliant. I mean, I don't, yeah. I think I would pick it up and be like, I don't <laughs> What do I do? The main debate came from, and this happens a lot with uh, quote unquote screenwriter Twitter, um, which is you just get a lot of people who have been told, especially like, you know, younger writers, earlier writers and stuff like you, you are told not to do shit like this. Yeah. And then you see successful people doing stuff like this and that it becomes this kind of like, there has to be a point in your career where you, as a writer, where you realize, like, am I, I've, I've learned what I need to learn, um, now I need to do. And if that comes out one way or it comes out, it, it just kind of, you kind of have to take over your own process at a certain Yes, point. It's like um, anything yeah. acting, too. Like, you again, with auditions, right? Same when you move into audition, they're like, here are all things you never do in an audition. <laughs> right. And then you read about someone doing it, and you're like, well, mother. Yep. Um, but I think that you're right. But it's also knowing, like, it's knowing time and place, right? Like there's a time yes. and place where you need to write, I'm sure, again, I'm not a writer, but like write a, a, a clean screenplay that is that is standard to like, I'm gonna turn this in and the studio that's reading this is gonna be like, oh, I know what I'm reading. Just mm -hmm. like there's a time when like you go into an audition room and you're like, okay, I the, the risks and chances I'm going to take are risks and chances that I understand that this casting director is gonna like. And then there's other yeah. times where you can do uh, the actor from Stranger Things, who was also in Power Rangers, because my son's watching it. He's from Australia. Like they talk about his uh, for Billy, his audition for Billy, which is a great choice. Like he went on camera and he just stood there silently for like two minutes, I think. And like they, the cast director was like, "That's when he booked it." It was in that moment of him just. Yeah. But like you could send that same self tape to something else, and a cast director would be like, "I wanted ninety seconds." 
totally. And you gave me two minutes yeah. before you talked. Nope. Yeah. It, it's just, well, it's knowing time and place, right? Knowing right. Like, yes. when, it's, when you can do it. And keeping in mind, like, the, he knew he was going to be directing this. So we do have to wonder what would it have been if this was just a spec script that he was selling, you know, yeah. trying to pitch. If anything, I um, wish, I think yeah. it's out there, but I would like to see the first 10 pages yeah. of this script, especially yeah. because yeah. my assumption is, with how quickly it moves and how little dialogue it is, the aliens are probably showing up by like page nine or 10. So that's yeah. like, a, they always say like, you want to grab people by the pages. Yeah. Um, so. Well, and he, I, I will say this, I watched an interview with him and then I do want to fast forward a little bit through the plot mm -hmm. before, cause we're, we're going up on the hour already. I knew this would happen. I knew this always happens. Um, Every time. You guys are too, you guys are too acty and, and, and directy and righty. Um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. That's why you're here. That is, that uh, is in my bio. <laughs> um, I'm gonna put that on my bio now. Very specific, very specific. But in um, this type, just one big block of words. I love it. What was I saying? Oh, God damn it! Uh, moving forward to the plot, I would actually like to help with that because you yes, said please, something please. at the beginning here that made me feel like such an idiot. Um, which is the Cain and Abel aspect of this, um, oh, which I didn't even catch on to. Yes, because we <laughs> the biblical allegories. Yeah, because it's you know she basically has the mark of Cain on her um, because she, and not only that, she, so we come to learn through this thing going inside of her or like right before that. The, the dragon fruit. Maybe, yes, the dragon the fruit. fruit. Um, that the thing that everyone is mad at her for is that when she was 12, her best friend pushed her, she grabbed a rock and killed her best friend. Like just one hit and it killed her best friend. Um, Done. And then since then, everyone in the town has like you know despised her like she, again she has this mark of king because in yeah. the bible oh, small in town God, everyone yeah. probably it's, knew oh, her, the, knew yeah, them yeah yeah, yeah. Oh. yeah um, god oh. told cain to slay abel and he did with a rock and then wandered for the rest of his life with this mark of being a murderer i think in the bible it's the first murder um yeah. So I didn't catch that at all when I was watching it. It literally just took you saying it well, at the beginning of this, the biblical stuff. <laughs> and then what does she do to this alien? She takes one swing with something and kills it. I mean, oh, it's right. the, the yeah. mirroring of a lot of this right. is so That's interesting. Right. Um, yeah. Well, and we'll get to the, the religious, the allegory a little bit later, because I have a quote from Guillermo del Toro about mm. that, because he actually mm. tweeted out about how much he absolutely loved this film and the religious undertones he mm -hmm. found in it. Um, Stephen King as well, I think commented on yeah. it in some respects. Um, but yeah, yeah, Andrew, thank you. So Stephen, we, King, we Stephen do... King compared it. And I think this is actually a great companion piece. And I would imagine that a lot of your audience has already seen this, uh, but there's a twilight zone episode that is also almost entirely silent. Yep. We and, will get to yep. that. Yep. yep. And yep. Stephen, Stephen King compared it to that specifically. As which like place. i cannot think of a higher compliment for a filmmaker to receive. Absolutely. <laughs> from stephen king from rod surly i mean this guy's getting the top horror people out there um saying how much they enjoy this movie and i would have to agree i there there was someone on my instagram when i posted we were going to be doing this and they said why would you cover such a stupid film what a waste uh, of time and i I just feel sorry for that person. Listen, I'm just going to say, yeah. everyone has, everyone's entitled to their opinion. Right. And I know a lot of people probably right. didn't like this movie. You could do but, a poll that says, says, do you like having money? And you will always get that person who's like, no. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. 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 Anyways, anyway, I, yeah. I, I have to learn to not take those things so personally. But, um, okay. So, so we find out that she, um, through all these reveals, the town's not talking to her, whatnot. We also see that it's not just her home that was invaded. Right. We're seeing right. a full-on invasion happening. Yeah. Um, yeah. We start to meet all different types of these gray aliens um, that yeah. come to hunt her Did down. Did you like that? That's what I want. I want to ask both of you guys. Did yeah. you like the variety of grays, yeah. especially I oh my God. Gymo yeah. Praying Mantis gray? Because <laughs> I, 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 the, praying, the Praying Mantis one, especially because the... It coming over the house, I thought looked incredible. And um, like signaling, signaling to the spaceship, I thought was interesting. Yep. Special I, effects I, I, also were amazing. Let's just say that off the bat. I agree. And, and I and I I would actually I'm a little bit curious about what the budget will be because I would be surprised if it was that low. 
22 million. That's not super low. That's around what most movies should cost. Uh, That's, can I say something? Is the key word, 22, no, $22 million is the exact amount of money that was given to the secret Pentagon UFO program. Wait, really? There's got to be something to that. I'm just saying. God damn it. I'm just saying, guys. <laughs> but I, so I, I think um, the different designs of the grays having the different kinds of grays it's a beautiful sim there's a beautiful simplicity to it because yes. you are still upping the stakes while not getting into oh here's an a i was i just kind of you just kind of immediately go like all right that little one is kind of like their attack animal and this one is it's like big <laughs> bigger one and like there's you know i i just i i personally really enjoyed that and i thought it was a smart simple way to keep raising the stakes because we yep. just you know we start with a gray and it's like all right well where do you go from there like we have mm -hmm. aliens within the first 15 minutes so where do you where do you go from there it's like what do you make them i was curious because i was on the fence of, like, <laughs> I, I liked it. it i was on the fence about it i just wasn't sure mm -hmm. like i was once like oh this is cool again i like that the well, one was like signaling to the ship which i thought was really a cool like touch um but then there was also part of me that was like Man, that is that's a big old alien. That's a that's a big ass dude. Um, it was a bold. It was a bold choice. It, I mean, choice. because when it. when you think of the gray aliens, um, they're often thought of to be very prototypical, very um robotic, very uniform. So they all look like the same exact thing. A lot of people right. believe they're just like drones. They're just like AI robots that the actual intelligence sent here like we would send a probe to another planet um huh. so you would kind of expect them to all be the same but what i'm seeing in this movie is the the writer did not see them as just uh i do think he sees them as a type of drone and i will get to that um as we okay. start to wrap things up but yeah. i think he wanted to give them some sort of um uh uniqueness and he said in a lot of interviews i wanted to give these aliens like s some sort of culture like uh, they, yeah. they're they're not just a typical gray alien. Um, they mm -hmm. have motives. They have agenda. It's not just to eradicate these people. Um, no, and I mean they don't yeah. even really seemingly get pissed until she kills. But like starts knocking them off. Um, you know what I right. mean? Like it's almost and like I think that's why they annoyed. really. Yeah, sorry, I, I Andrew. Think I think that's why they paid out. attention to her. Like they yeah. saw, oh whoa, she's not like just you know praising us and like becoming mind overpowered um in the mind like the rest of these people are like she's she's she fighting back like against a pet. Yeah. Yes, yeah. thank you yes yeah yes um and that I was something that. that i actually loved too was the alien scene to at least like you have the you have the gray that dies you have the gray that's the other gray who like seems a little more advanced like throw when she goes to stab it like pushes her away big old mantis gray and then tiny little attack dog gray I just like that each alien felt I love very, that little one. Yeah, like, but they had personality, right? Like, it was a really nice, sure. like, the little alien when I was like, that little dude is here to, like, mess some people up. Like, it is not messing around. It just, like, I just liked it. I, like, they were a character in and of themselves, too. And you're like, I, I thought that was cool. I thought that I actually really liked that. that like, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're like, oh, I would, so like, I would like to get a little bit into the ending if we can. Just yeah. yes, let's do it. In a couple yeah. minutes. Let's do it. So so we get through. She um, she has this thing go in her throat. She's shown a vision of what her friend like. Basically, her friend now. And what I love this is again a cla like Black Mercy. If you ever read one Superman comic book, read um, for the man who has everything, um, written by Alan Moore. Um, it's uh, and I can't remember the artist. Right, Curtis Swan maybe. Um, but it is about a like this plant that basically gives Superman the life he always wanted, which is the, like he grows up on Krypton and has a family and all this stuff, but it's all fake. And it takes him realizing that it's fake because he knows he doesn't have that to escape it. Sorry if I just spoiled the comic book for you. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> it's still incredible to watch. And they actually did a great adaptation of it in the Justice League cartoon um, is, or yeah. Justice League Unlimited. Um, Justice League Unlimited. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so, um, she sees this grown up version of her friend. She realizes that's impossible and pulls this thing out of her. At which point the aliens kind of like leave her alone. And we see her at the end now dancing with all these, the rest of the town being accepted uh, by all of these people who have no control of themselves. I thought it was incredibly like, dark like and fucked up. Oh yes, my God. Like, 
really wonderful, like really messed up and really, cause again, cause the twist already, you're just like, Oh God, she killed her friend. Like that, that's heavy. And then Super it gets dark, kind of, yeah. it, and it's even darker where she's just like, Oh, okay. Well, everybody was really mean to me before, but now because they all have zero control over themselves and these aliens like me, I get to dance Let's, with people instead of exactly. by myself. How <laughs> perfect. How like, to me, that's like, how human do you take this person who's like, never yeah. had anything. And like, you had it like, again, like a really loved pet. These aliens are like, no, oh, all right, cool. We'll, we'll make it good for you. Ray, if and she's she was just Ray, them how to be human, she's thank doing you, a very Ray. bad job. <laughs> Ray, well, I, 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 I actually, ag- that's just a joke. I agree. I agree with that. Yeah. I yeah. agree with Ray wholeheartedly um, yeah. because the big thing about these gray aliens is that they lack emotion. They don't right. understand emotion. They don't understand um, a lot of what humans are. And that's why they are here and curious and experimenting and, and doing these things. Um, so I loved this idea that they like, we're trying to figure out what is different about this girl from the rest of these people. Right. And they, you kind of see them on the ship as they have her in their grasp, like trying to understand and they kind of look into her past and see what had happened in that she has become so isolated and forgive the pun alienated. And they kind of make her confront that. And Oh yeah. my God, this is like, yeah, twist, but also like the fact that these aliens who are here to like take over the planet gave this person the like, finally, um, a like way to demons. confront her quote unquote demons, confront what she did and find that forgiveness in herself. Um, I think really that is the core of this story, yeah. right? Is kind of yeah. yeah. learning to accept something and I guess overcoming tragedy, overcoming uh, oh, guilt. Wait, wait, wait. And... Does she overcome it though? Because she lives in a town where everyone's now nice to her because they're made to be nice to her. Like, I don't know if that's overcoming as much as it's like, again, the panel, well, we'll come back to like we're gonna give like here's your atrium like here is like we you are our dog now you're yeah. and you got lucky and we are nice to our dog and so we're gonna give you all the things that we think our tiny little human dog wants which is to be accepted hmm. to be loved to be happy here's all these things you've been doing on your own now you get to do them with people like mm-hmm. I don't know if she yeah, finds forgiveness as much as she finds happiness. Because sure. she's been so ostracized. Yes. Yeah. Well, and yeah. I think that's why the aliens give her happiness. Um, yeah, but yeah. I think it really depends on how you take this ending. Um, sure. That's kind of, I think, Andrew, I talked to you offline a little about this. I still don't know if this ending is real or not in terms of the reality of the movie that just mm. played out. Like, gotcha. did this yeah. actually happen at the end? Is she really happy? Is she really amongst these people? I envisioned, I thought like we were going to get this happy ending and then we were going to find out she's still on the ship and she's yeah, still sure. like um, being experimented on and the world is still being taken over. And But that didn't happen. So you're kind no. of left wondering. Well, and I think I, I would err more on the side of the uh, darker version of it, which is that these people are all slaves and she's okay with that now because they're treating her nice. <laughs> you know I, what I mean? No one's going to spit your face right. if she goes to trial and file a police yeah. report anymore. And there, you that, know what I mean? That yeah. moment, I think, is really important to this ending working, right? Because mm-hmm. then you have to like her. But, like, to me, I remember watching it, and the most horrifying part of this movie is when she gets spit on. Because to yeah. me, there is nothing more, like, degrading and just dehumanizing than, like, to be spat on. And mm-hmm. so at that point, I was like, well, like, I couldn't imagine doing that. to Like, even and again, we're both, you know, Andrew, you and I are parents. Like, I, that to me is my greatest fear. Like, my, my like you losing my kid would just crush sure. me in, inside now. Um, I still don't know if I could spit on some. I don't know if I could do that because it's such a, like, dehumanizing thing that when you get to the end, you're like, well, I, you know. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I don't tell you and and who's let, right, who's right behind you dancing? It's those parents. Yeah. It's hilarious. Yeah. And she lets everybody else get literally dehumanized. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, so, so, gentlemen, on that note, I have to run. Yes. Um, My thank friend. you yes. so much. I love you both. Mwah. Love thank you. Everybody love for you, Andrew. Out with us today. These, you guys are in good hands. And um, yeah, I'm around. <laughs>
You'll find me. Thank you, buddy. We'll we'll put Thank links you. for all your stuff in the show notes. Thank you. Oh, him. he's amazing. Thanks. You're amazing. Get out of here. Thank you, Suzanne. Bye. Bye, Al. Bye. Um, and then there were two. Nick, how long do you have, buddy? Oh, uh, I have some more time. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, let's. Well, I'm trying to think if there's nothing we really need to rewind back to. Um, we are sort of, you know, uh, towards the end of like this story but yeah what do you make of what is like your overall i guess um what's your takeaway from the story that played out that's so, a big question but yeah yeah what do you think? No, i mean overall kind of like i think andrew was talking about and you were talking about like i liked it i mean um i did not find so in some ways uh you know because we've watched these alien abduction movies together and i know that like from listening to the podcast like the, the controversy you talked about like around these type of movies and how they paint these these incidences um so like it didn't scare me like it didn't it didn't feel the movie in itself the monster movie part of it did not feel revolutionary to me right like so yeah. i watched i'm like oh okay yep monsters come down she fights monsters she takes out some monsters ultimately like monsters kind of win i guess because you're not going to beat the aliens one-on-one -on -one. um and so like in that way i was like okay this feels nothing like i'm not watching anything um revolutionary but i did love like i loved the nuances of the aliens i love the nuances of um how it was set up and how it was executed so to me like it's a really really well executed film um that i enjoyed it's like it's not the best thing i've ever watched um but it definitely like mer i would it would merit me saying like you should watch this movie if you like movies just the silence part just the way that like that director executed the whole storytelling without dialogue, anytime a movie does that, be it um, the Mike Flanagan film, which I'm forgetting the name of it off the top of my head. Um, or it this, Hush? Like, yes. Hush. Whenever there's no dialogue, um, and I just, I think that it's such a challenge to watch a movie do that and then to do something like this and do it successfully. Um, I also, again, said this earlier on, the thing that I loved about this movie that I think it did so well um, is I, by the end, by the time we find out what happened, I didn't care. Um, I just, I was like, I know something bad happened. I figured that somehow someone died. Like I, I had gotten to that point and I was like, but I don't, if I didn't find out, I didn't find out because I was too invested in like, how is she going to get out of this? What's going to happen to her? Like, I, I just, it didn't, it no longer mattered to me. Um, yeah. And I thought that was really interesting that that's where I went as a viewer. Um, but it was great. But again, I don't know if I would have seen this movie in theaters. When I talk about like it being accessible as a streamer, I don't know if like if I'm choosing my, again, in my time when you have a kid and you have to make those decisions, if I'm choosing a scary movie, I don't know if like this is the one that like I'm going to the theater to watch. But having it on a streaming platform, I was like, well, yeah, of course. But this is great. This is a great way for me to watch this film. Um, yeah. You know, I do. But, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm the more I think about it, the more I'm like, yeah, this is meant to be like I had to watch it twice um, mm -hmm. because the first time I was like, what? Like, wait, what? Um, yeah. And those last like 20 minutes, I think, is where people are really having big debates about like if they like the movie or not. But I I stress to people like go back, rewatch it first as like a fun um, trying to s escape an alien uh invasion film because that's yeah. that's what it is most primarily this film is like her fighting against the aliens and and whatnot um but then go watch it again and look at the the bigger picture and sort of these allegories we've talked about and and what the filmmaker was trying to to sort of get across um i i think you're right being able to go back and stream this again um you you do gain a better respect for it I think, um, yeah, it's it it didn't like break any barriers. It's not no. like revolutionary, but what it did and the the form it took, I think it 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 knocked it out of the park. It's executed really well, and I I do think, and this is why I wish we still had Andrew. Like to me, uh, it's it's a really risky film. Um, again, not because it's an, but just by like for that director to be like, okay, so here's the deal. I'm going to make this movie and like, we're not going to say anything. And someone could be like, okay, but there's so much storytelling that happens that to take, to make that choice in a monster movie that is not like the quiet. Cause even think about the quiet place. There's dialogue. That movie is based around being quiet. Yet there's, and there's yeah. dialogue 
Good point. Everywhere. You know what I mean? And so to really be like, I'm going to, I'm going to lean into this. And the only dialogue you really get are aliens that you can't understand. Um, And I just think that that the execution of that is great because it never dropped. It's always moving. It's always frenetic. The aliens are all unique characters. She does a great job portraying her character. The world around her is a character. Um, All that stuff that you're looking for when you lack other actors and dialogue, the director creates. To me, in in that way, it is filmed remarkably. It's not too short. It's not too long. Like It it Mm -hmm. runs the right amount of time as a viewer. Um, And that just makes it a really good movie. Was 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 it scary? I mean, there's some moments, but I just thought it was just a good like just a good movie. I just really yeah. enjoyed watching it. Um, really surprised me. Really yeah. surprised me. Um, the one line that is spoken, I do want to bring up. What is, is it? Yeah. Her, it's her. I have it here. I'm sorry, Maud. Okay. Nice. Which, you know, you could have even done without that. Like she was such a good actor that she could have, conveyed that but again the fact that the one line we get is kind of the pinnacle of the the crux of the entire movie is feeling sorry about what you did confronting it and finally moving on um i really feel like that's what the aliens wanted to do they wanted to they they wanted to give her something see that's because they found her so incredibly unique um for some reason and maybe it is because she killed one of them. And as they started to hunt her down, they realized, oh, interesting. The choices she's making. Um, let's go back and see why she's making those well, the choices. The will, too. I think that was when I got out of it, too, was like just her her will her will to live, her will to fight, yeah. I think is what yeah. is what um like when I was watching like the aliens making this decision, right? Because that's the other thing that's really well done from a directorial standpoint, because the aliens are all CGI. So that's all, you know, your animators and your director is watching them make that choice. Like watching them be like, okay. Cause I knew when it was over, like she was going to live. Like I, I was like, she's going to make it out somehow, whatever, whatever this looks like. Um, and I felt that conclusion coming. Right. And to me, it was more about like, she had so much fight in her. She had so much will to live beyond what the other people had that they encountered in this town that that then sets her apart. Um, right. And that's what I like. That's what I liked so much about it. And again, I, you know, I always harken back. I'm sure this is not like I'm going to con- get into controversial territory, but like um, I wish I was better with names. The, 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 he's the physicist. He's a black dude. He's very smart. He's very funny. Oh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Thank you. Like, and, you know, he always talks about like, well, if there are aliens, they're going to look, if they're that smart, can do these things like we're bugs to them. And I know that, that yeah. can be a, a, not a, a controversial statement, but this I liked, I liked cause they kind of did that with her where it's like, okay, we, we are beyond these emotions or our emotion. Or we, we understand emotions differently, right? Cause we're putting human, you know, human stuff on something that would be inhuman. Um, and that's kind of how I always think about it. It's like, well, if they exist, then it's more like how we view animals that can be incredibly intelligent and experience things similar to we do, but it's so different that we constantly strive to figure that out. Like I think about dogs a lot because I have an older dog and, and it's funny how little studied dogs are. Like we really don't know a lot about it. Like how, like we do, we don't, we equate them to wolves, but that's not hundred percent correct. So we're just kind of like, here's this thing we know is smart and we know feels emotions, but like we do our best as pet owners and if we should have pets to like create a life for them. And I just, that's the feeling I got. They like have this thing, this person who has gone against some of their conceived notions and like, okay, well let's, you know, let's create a life for it and see what happens. Like, and we can just, yeah. walk, and then we can just hang up here and watch. It's like, a, it's like a, a great experiment, right? A great experiment, but like, but they're caring, but they are caring for her. Yeah. Right, but then we as people be like, but wait, is that caring for her? That's right. I think that's like the pet debate, right? Like, well, and I, I think that's the dog. genius of it, right? Because they to them the aliens are like, no, yes, that's me. Anyway. Doing, like, yeah. yeah, we are caring for her. Like, we they feel like they're doing the right thing, right? And then as people, you can be there's gonna be some people who be like, yeah, I mean mm-hmm. that's what a person would want, honestly. Yep. Like, uh, and then there's gonna be other people who are like, absolutely not. All those people are mind controlled, right. and it's that like 
you know, I was reading this article about like having a pet, you know, should we have pets? And some people are like, well, yes, you, it's love and companionship. And other people are like, well, absolutely not. Because is your pet's life really that great? Even if it's a right. good life. I, you know, I was just thinking a lot of, a lot about that. Um, cause it's not parent child, but cause the, the intelligent level is different. Um, oh, that's interesting. I, I just thought that was cool. Just that's to me, the ending, like that's what I grapple with is like, is this a happy ending? Is it not a happy ending? Like, what is this choice being made? What is because she is also basically a rat in a cage, right? After right. that, it's just a very for her at that moment a great cage until she realizes that she is essentially alone. Then what? Yeah. yeah, yeah. How long does that last? Right? Yeah, um, exactly. I just think those things are really. I think that's a lot of stuff to play with, which for makes sure. It, a much more advanced film to me, storytelling wise, than had it not had that ending. Agreed. Yeah, this is so much more than what you would think it would be. And yeah. that's what I loved about yeah. it. Um, I want to play Nick before we wrap this up because mm -hmm. um, we both got to get going soonish. Uh, a very brief clip with the director, Brian, about um, his inspiration for making the movie. I'm oh, going to play that really quick. It's like a minute long. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we'll we'll get some final thoughts. I do want to touch on that Twilight Zone thing that Andrew brought oh, up, yeah. too, because um, it is pretty uh, strikingly similar. So we'll get to that. But let me play this clip really quick, and we'll talk about it. It started with the the character that Caitlin Deaver plays, Bryn. I, I had this idea for the character. There's some spoilery inspirations for for her, but I was just like, this is such an interesting character. She's so young to have gone through so much um and what does that person look like in the day-to-day -day world um and as i was kind of working on that i had you know i i have like the movie theater in my mind that's playing all the different ideas i have and you know the walls crash down between these two movies and i was like that's really interesting you know it's the idea of like you know uh if this event happens you know it's gonna happen to everybody no matter it's gonna happen on someone's wedding day it's gonna happen Five minutes before or after someone dies, you know, it's just going to happen. It doesn't care um, what you're going through or who you are. And that felt like a really fun way into an alien invasion thing from the least likely person possible. This, this kind of recluse girl who is going through quite a lot in her life already and then has to deal with this other layer of drama on top of it. So uh, the, the ideas just got married in my mind. Um, and, and then it was kind of off the races, man. I love that. I love That's that. He's great. like, this could have happened to anyone. Um, this is who I chose to highlight. And, um, that's the story he wanted to tell. And, and such a good point too, of like those who claim these alien abductions or, or close encounter experiences, like it's not, oh, most of them don't expect it. Like it's, mm -hmm. it happens at the least uh, expected moment or it, it it happens in their life and it dramatically changes them forever. Um, and it doesn't care. It doesn't care what you did before. It doesn't care what happens to you after it's just, they're doing it for their reason. And, um, you know, the aftermath of that is for you to wrestle with. So I kind of like that. He said like, yeah, this will happen on, this this yeah. could happen on your wedding day. This could happen after like, oh, that was so cool. And it can happen to the person you least expect. Um, well, and he and chose this very interesting young character to base this around. And when we talk about storytelling, I think, you know, you talk about some writing perspective or um, like when I'm teaching theater, or teaching into the theater, um, you know, like that's kind of what I think good storytelling does. Like, I feel like there's two ways you tell a story. It's either like an, like a, an exceptional person in an exceptional time who steps up, right? Like, um, you know, so even when you have like, uh, I'm watching from right now, which is great. Uh, but you know, like that character in that film, in that show, you know, like he was an army person who like his whole thing was problem solving. So like, while he's an everyday person, like he has this exceptional trait, right. Um, I think that's one way to tell stories. Like it's this moment, but I also think when you can take, uh, much like life where you think about like things happen in your life that are not movie like, like the biggest things happen when you like least expect it or like it doesn't it doesn't matter so i was thinking like recently uh you and i were all talking before and i said like i had gotten covid like and my wife is traveling for work for a month so it's just me and our small son 
some single parenting. And like, I, in my mind, I'm like the worst possible moment for me to get COVID would be like, while she is gone. And sometimes right. that's how it happens. And that's like out of the script. And sometimes like you get COVID randomly when you're like, it's just, that's how life, like it just, I think that he plays with ideas that, um, yeah, it can happen at any time. It can happen to an extraordinary person, an unextraordinary person. I think that going either direction, I think is really good storytelling. Um, even if she is kind of extraordinary, because she is such a recluse that lives this, that's creating a life for herself. Um, hmm. I'm rambling. I'm sorry. No, but, no, 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 no. I, it's <laughs> such a good point. Like it can um, happen to anyone. And a lot of people are like, well, then why don't like presidents get abducted by aliens or like, um, these nuclear physicists like why aren't they the ones that aliens are interested in and um i mean that's the big then, question though right when all yeah, of this is like, it's a like, great question so for someone who's more i mean you and i have talked about this like i definitely believe there's life beyond us because to me mathematically there's no way that there isn't mm -hmm. you know what i mean like whether however that aliens exist i think that you know that it is it's you're silly to think that there is not something else beyond us um, but that is always the question, right? Like, why is it only people that, like lesser, like people who aren't in these high positions of notoriety, not that some people do experience that to be fair, but like, it's always like the person that you least expect. Right. And yeah. I think that that's why it can be hard for some people sometimes, because they're like, well, why is it Joe Smo down the alley as opposed to me or like, right. said, like the why me or why not me? Exactly. I think. That's what a lot of experiencers ask um themselves and even asked me um so I think that's why the military ones yeah. are such a big deal like when you have like which mm -hmm. you know as you follow news like when a when a pilot for all intents and purposes like when you have to like talk to like hardcore military person my brother was in the army you know um uh, you know or someone like that when they experience that you're like oh okay mm -hmm. well something's going on here because they have they have no horse in the race to to, to have that experience like it's there's no right. benefit to them not saying there's benefit to other people but like if I'm like, oh, I had this experience or like, I'm also an actor and I'm also like, you could be like, well, that dude just wants attention so he could, but like a dude flying a jet has no, like, there's no, there's no uh, incentive there to me yeah. to be like, by the way, I saw this crazy thing. And uh, yeah. Um, For sure. That's, I think that's why military witnesses lend so much credibility to mm -hmm. a lot of what's, and we're seeing it play out right now. I mean, oh, I, I need to talk now, about that separately because we I'm, will. I'm fully yeah. in the weeds and trying to figure that stuff out, but um, I'll, we'll go through it. Um, I, I do want to um, touch on the Twilight Zone thing um, mm -hmm. because I also have to get going too. Um, but let's, let's, I'm here for you guys. Here. I'll stay. Nick's going to continue I'll the stay show the whole time. You're amazing. I love you. Um, so this was an episode, season two, episode 15 of the Twilight Ooh. Zone called The Invasion. Um, and this revolves around an old woman who lives alone in a remote cabin. And after hearing strange deafening noises above her kitchen roof, she's accosted by small intruders that come from a miniature flying saucer that has landed on a rooftop. Two tiny figures, which appear to be robots or beings wearing presser Pressure suits emerge from the craft. Small figures attack the woman. Um, let's see here. With pistol-like weapons that leave radiation burns on her skin. And after following her into her cabin, slashing her ankle and hand with her own kitchen knife, uh, she eventually kills one, wrapping it in a blanket and beating it until it's still, then throwing it into the burning fireplace. She follows the other to the saucer ship on a roof, which she proceeds to attack with a hatchet. Um, this is kind of the... Uh, this last paragraph is the twist, you know, the Twilight Zone twist, yeah. as they always do. Um, a voice speaking in English emanates from within the craft. The intruder frantically warns that his partner, Gresham, is dead and that the planet is inhabited by a race of giants and impossible to defeat. The side of the ship reads U.S. Air Force Space Probe Number 1. The tiny invaders were human um, from Earth and the woman in the small farmhouse belongs to a race of giant humanoids native to another planet. Oh. She finishes destroying the ship and then climbs back down from the roof into the house exhausted. Um, and the distinctive features of this episode include, include a near solo performance by one character and an almost complete lack of dialogue. I mean, this clearly had to be the biggest inspiration. For yeah. This movie. I mean, hundred <laughs> percent. It's crazy. The parallels that well, the um, red zone is brilliant in of itself. So yeah. 
Uh, and they always, I love those twists. Like there was another episode where like these people are trying to get off of a planet because they know the world's about to end. And they're like, oh, who are we going to bring with us? Who are we going to bring with us? And then they finally get off the planet and they start heading to this new planet and come to find out that new planet is Earth. So they were aliens all along and in their planet. And of the, ah. apes, the apes have taken over apes. Earth and soil and green is people, Ryan. Soil, <laughs> soil and green is people. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we have a clear example here. This yeah. isn't the first time this device of no dialogue has been used. However, um, what isn't inspired by the Twilight Zone? And a lot has been, and a lot of it has been complete and utter shit. But when you look at something like no one will save you, I again I feel like this is this is done right. This is yeah, oh. homage to something that came before it, done almost to perfection, in my personal opinion. Well, it's like I mean, it's like anything we talk about, like writing or performances, or you know, it's like playing. I think Shakespeare's great, right? Because like you're mm -hmm. gonna do, you've got to play Hamlet, right? And there are you know, Hamlet has been played by the most amazing actors ever. Um, and so you watch that and you have to think like, well, how do I do this? How do I tackle this? And I think one of the ways when you, when you do something that's been done or you're doing something that's an adaption of something else, um, you need to keep what works about it. Right. So that's what I think he did. You know, this person alone in, in a cabin, you know, very little dialogue. So it's all about like creating the characters in the world around you. Um, but then understanding like, well, what do I bring to it that, that makes it unique and makes it new? Um, and again, I think this is why theater acting is so important. So if you're playing Hamlet, right? Hamlet's this very intellectual character and, and thinks through all his feelings. Well, there is a level of that that's inherent to the story. But then if you're an actor who isn't that, right? Like you are a physical actor, someone who isn't as cerebral, like you can do that. You just have to make it your own. You have to find those things that then make it unique. So in this film, I think that's what this director writer did is like, okay, there's this idea that's inspired me about it. Uh, I'm going to do a story like that, but I'm going to add in these other dynamics that make it different. Um, and then I'm going to execute it really well. It's in the execution that I think it works. An example would be, you know, you look at like the Honeymooners, the Flintstones and the Simpsons and then Family Guy, which do all four, <laughs> right? Like yeah. they're all kind of the same thing. Right. Um, and they're all variations of the like stupid dad sitcom family type thing. But they're all executed if you like those shows. I mean, The Simpsons, I think we can really lay down as a very well-executed TV show. It's how they are executed, right? Or, you know, you uh, a really good cover of a song. Mm -hmm. It's it's all in that execution of it. Like, it's the same thing. It's the same notes. It's the same lyrics. It's the same all that jazz. But it's just a matter of, like, well, how am I going to put a spin on this? And then how am I going to make sure it works really well? It's why something like, the Vince Vaughn Psycho doesn't work, even though it's a Ooh. shot for shot remake. Um, you can't do that. Um, but yeah. you can do something like let the right one in or let me in versus let the right one in, which is not shot. It's very similar in terms of the American adaption to the Swedish adaption. Uh, Denmark, Den Den Denmark? Um, uh, yeah, I'm Danish, not sure. Danish. But either way, and I'm reading the book right now too, like, that that adaption is so well done because it makes just enough tweaks yes to make it its own thing for an american audience while still adhering to what made the first thing so successful and the movie the danish movie does just enough from the book that makes it still successful i think that with a mm -hmm. movie like this taking that idea executing it really well understanding how to tell a story making it really tight and then making the tweaks you need like different sized aliens or, you know, how the aliens move, like those little things, those little touches are what makes such a good story and a different Absolutely. and a good twist too, right? Like a really good twist that you can, you can think about, you can parse out like, is this happy? Is this sad? Is it, is it? Uh, I'm biggest? still thinking about it, which is key. Yeah. Dude. Like yeah, if you great. can leave watching a movie or a play and think about it, um, for days, weeks, months after, like you've done your job. I mean, how many plays have you been to or movies where like you leave and you're like, yep, uh, wait, wait, what did I just see or what yeah. happened? Yeah. Well, so I mean, even, even we think about like the movie that we did together, like that ending when you talk about like, is this a happy ending? Is this a sad ending? Do two people still come together or not? Like 
letting as an audience kind of feel that out, I love, but I do love, it's still an ending, right? Like you get a definitive, like there's a period, right? Like I, mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I know the ending of this story. It's just a matter of like, how do I feel about it? Right. Yeah. How can and how I do you get there? And right. And what does that say about me as a human? I think that's someone said it earlier. Was it Ray? Like, mm-hmm. what does it say about me and how I feel about this ending as, as a human being? Like, what does that, how does it paint me as a person? Cause if I'm like, no, mm-hmm. this is happy ending. Well, then does that mean that I think all these people should be enslaved? Should be because like, should, what, does my happiness override, you know, the unhappiness of the rest of society? Or, freedom it, of it's, society. Yeah, it, it's there's a lot of big questions to be yep. asked, and I think the movie did it brilliantly. Yep. Um, all right, man, all let's right. wrap it up. Would you recommend No One Will Save You? Oh, one million percent. I think it's also, I also think it's a really good movie for if you have like a teenager, like it's a really good scary movie for like a 13 year old, too. If you want to give oh, them something more scary and fun to watch, and like you can, because I think about stuff as a parent, like. <laughs> and you want to have a conversation later because I think that's something that's fun about plays and movies and TV shows of stuff that you can talk about. And I think this is a good movie that you could like watch and then talk about it. Um, and so, yeah, I would recommend it just for fun, but especially like, if you're a parent who wants to like get your kids into like kind of scary movies um, that is a little bit on the safer side, yeah. um, but still deals with a lot of like complex things, both like with the death of a friend and like the ending and also um you know, loneliness and isolation. I just think that it deals a lot of stuff that I think would be our good conversation starters. If you're trying to get wow. some young person into yeah. the world. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Like a lot of these struggles as the character in the movie, um, who's maybe a little older, but, um, she's does deal 20, with a lot of friend dies and her, the date on the gravestone is 2000 right? to 2012. <laughs> they made that very simple. 23 <laughs> years old. And I watched that going. My ass is old. <laughs> Yeah, I yep. know that feeling. Yep. Born in two thousand, just let that, let that, just let that. Uh, don't that land. remind me. I just, oh god, the X Files yeah. just celebrated their thirtieth anniversary. So I'm going through a lot of existential crisis right now, buddy. Me too. Oh, you're older than me. Well, that's okay, buddy. Oh, I hate you. No, yeah. I love you, Nick. I love you. Um, before I let you go, my man. Um, where can we find anything you're up to? Are you visible on social media or yeah? yeah. What's I'm primarily visible on Instagram. That's probably the best. I mean, Facebook too. Both those things are live. Um, but like Instagram is probably the one if you're looking for more the less personal follow. I have a Twitter X, whatever. I don't use it though. I'm going to be honest. Um, <laughs> I don't blame you. Uh, but yeah, Instagram. Uh, it's just N Westmeyer. I'm the only I'm the only one. That's where I put all my cool. baking and stuff that's going on with acting or just pictures of my daddy and my dad life, which is just me posting memes from the dad. <laughs> I love it. It brings so much joy to my life. Um, <laughs> unlike this movie. Um, no, I'm kidding. I recommend this movie wholeheartedly. thought yeah. it was fantastic. Um, whether you're into UFOs or not, guys, it tells a very human story from a very non-human perspective. So it can be a funny movie or a monster movie. It really can be either way you want to look yeah. at it. I think that's what's nice about it. If you wonder like a monster movie, it's that too. I love that. I love that, brother. All right. I'm going to let you go, and I'm going to debrief with the audience here for a little bit, but thank you so much for sticking Of course. Thank you, man, for having me. You know I love doing it. All right. We'll talk soon. All right. Bye. Bye. All right, guys. That is it. My special thanks to Andrew Sanford and Nicholas Westermeyer. Um, This was awesome. Uh, I knew. I always tell them, this would be 45 minutes, maybe an hour. Never happens. Um, That's what happens when you get friends together uh, who have a huge appreciation for film. And this is definitely, I think all three of us could agree um, that we appreciate this film and it uh, really did. um, It really did a lot in the amount of time that we had with it. So definitely check it out. No one will save you available on Hulu to stream right now. Um, I saw that Suzanne start a couple things here. So I'm going to go ahead and check those out and then we will wrap things up guys. Um, we have here, Bill says, Ryan, um, is Ryan going to watch the Tom dog movie monsters of California? Yes, Bill. I have watched it. Um, I did a mini review of it actually on last week's live stream. So if you go back and look at last week, excuse me, um, last week's live stream, um, towards the end, I do give a mini review of monsters of California. Um, but for right now, uh, I liked it. 
it was fun. Um, a lot of inside baseball for those of us in the UFO field who have been following Tom DeLong's work. Um, it found its way subtly into, and not so subtly in some ways, into Monsters of California. It's a total dude movie, total Blink-182 skater, West Coast sort of movie. Um, but yeah, I thought it had some heart to it. Um, acting was fantastic all around. Um, the story was interesting. Um, but yeah, I would definitely recommend people check it out. It was a lot of fun. It was a labor of love for Tom DeLong, And as his directorial debut, um, thought he did a pretty good job. Um, I think he will learn and grow as a director from here. And hopefully that will influence his uh, future projects. But yeah, I thought it was a good uh, first time out for him as a director. And um, the soundtrack was amazing. Um, the cinematography was gorgeous absolutely gorgeous um special effects were good there's some ufo stuff some bigfoot stuff um i thought they did a really good job so definitely check out monsters of california as well guys um and then let me just go right back up to the chat one more time here then i'm going to say goodbye to you guys um do you recommend no one will save you i'd love to know what you guys think Let me see. Let me see. Susan, or excuse me, Susan says the actress has every talent to tell in her emotions with her actions. That's why it's so amazing. Different for sure. I agree. I agree. Bill says, I like Nope too. Nope is one of my favorite movies, Bill. It's skyrocketed up in terms of UFO content for so for sure. Um, all right, guys, I think that's going to do it for tonight. Thank you so much for joining me. Again, go check out No One Will Save You right now on Hulu. My special thanks to Nick, to Andrew, and of course, as always, to Suzanne for running the chat tonight. She did an awesome, awesome job. Um, and that's it, guys. Uh, and just to let you know, there will be no live stream this upcoming Sunday. I will be somewhere in the skies <laughs> flying to Nova Scotia to hunt ghosts for the next month. Um, but you can, you can be there on my social media to follow my endeavors over there in Canada as I investigate some of Canada's most haunted locations for the television show Haunted. So be on the lookout for that. And be on the lookout for a brand new episode of Someone in the Skies premiering this upcoming Monday where we explore the Exeter UFO incident. And we've got some awesome interviews coming your way. After that, we've got an astrophysicist, Diana walsh Pasolka. We had an incredible conversation, so I can't wait for you to hear that. Um, but other than that, guys, I will leave you, as always, with our mantra here. And that is, keep your feet on the ground, but never stop searching somewhere in the skies. Take care. Keep looking up. There's nothing to hide. There's nothing to hide at all.